Olá, boa noite. Herzlich willkommen im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zu einer Veranstaltung der Reihe Lecture und Film Tropical Underground, das brasilianische Cinema Marginal und die Revolution des Kinos. Seit Oktober 2017 haben wir diese Reihe hier zum Cinema Marginal, wie Sie wahrscheinlich schon wissen, eine sehr umfangreiche Präsentation dieses Kino. Die Reihe geht bis zum bis Juli. So, wir haben die heutige Veranstaltung und zwei noch bis Ende dieser Reihe hier im Filmmuseum. Ich will mich nochmal bedanken bei unseren Partnern, dem Institut für Theater, Film und Medien und dem Exzellenzcluster, die Herausbildung normativer Ordnungen bei der Goethe-Universität. Und dank dieser Beteiligung der Uni und des Clusters können wir diesen freien Eintritt hier anbieten. Deswegen freuen wir uns sehr auch über diese Partnerschaft. Also, wie Sie wissen auch schon wahrscheinlich, dass Tropical Underground viel mehr ist als nur diese Lecture- und Filmreihe. Das ist natürlich ein großer Teil von dieser Veranstaltungsreihe, aber wir haben auch zum Beispiel vor zwei Wochen die äh, Tagung, ähm, diese internationale Tagung im Museum Angewandter Kunst mit dem Titel Das andere 68, Anthropophage Revolutionen in der brasilianischen Gegenkultur nach 1968. Das war eine herausragende ähm, Gelegenheit, äh, sehr wichtige Leute hier nach Frankfurt zu bringen. Wir haben super interessante Diskussionen mit den Gästen über brasilianische Gegenkultur 60 und 70er Jahre im Bereich Kino, Kunst, Literatur, Musik und einfach in der Gesellschaft. Das war wirklich sehr, sehr toll. Für die, die, das nicht, die nicht teilnehmen könnten, können Sie schon die Vorträge im, im YouTube anschauen. Die sind alle schon online bei YouTube, von, an der YouTube-Channel von dem Cluster Normative Orders und auch auf unserer Webseite www.tropical underground.de ähm, und ich wollte noch äh, ganz kurz ein paar ähm, Einladungen machen, weil wie gesagt, Tropical Underground ist auch nicht nur hier im Kino, aber auch. Ähm, wir haben also äh, unser normales Programm oder komplettes Programm in unserer Flyer, den Sie schon seit Oktober kennen, aber wir haben auch nur jetzt einen neuen Flyer, mit der, ähm, besonders mit der Veranstaltung am 22. Juni. Das ist, äh, da haben wir eine sehr spezielle Präsentation von Super Art Filmen von Elio H. Seeker im Sasfe Pavilion und es wird wirklich eine einmalige Chance, diese Filme zu erleben und äh, das wollte ich ähm, natürlich für die, die mehr Informationen wollen, gibt es draußen diese Flyers. Äh, nächster Mittwoch ist auch im Musonturm eine sehr interessante äh, Veranstaltung mit dem Titel Verschlingung Einführung in den brasilianischen Hunger. Das wird eine multimediale Lesung, ähm, Präsentation mit Ricardo Domenech und Oliver Precht, der schon mehrmals hier bei uns war und wir freuen uns sehr, dass sie über Anthropophagie in der brasilianischen Literatur sprechen werden. Das ist dann äh, nächster Mittwoch schon am 13. um 18 Uhr im Sonnturm und der Eintritt ist frei. Ähm, am 21. dann Ober nächste Woche haben wir wieder Lecture, wie üblich, äh, mit Irene Small und Memoirs of a Strangle of Blondes, ein sehr eher unbekannter Film von Giulio Bressani. Ähm, das wird auch sehr spannend sein. Und dann ähm, am 24. wollte ich noch, äh, und das komme ich dann zum Thema des Abends, äh, am 24. Juni zeigen wir hier den Dokumentarfilm Torquato Neto, Every Hour of the End. Und es ist ein Dokumentarfilm über Torquato Neto, worüber wir heute äh, sprechen werde, nämlich eigentlich unser Gast, ähm, Leo Filippi, wird äh, über Vampires and the Palace, äh, aber auch über Torquato Neto sprechen. So, ich wollte schon äh, darauf hinweisen, dass wir diesen Dokumentarfilm Ende des Monats zeigen, für die, die mehr über Torquato wissen wollten. Wie Sie alle schon wissen, wir werden demnächst, äh, so, ähm, zunächst den Vortrag hören, dann haben wir eine kleine Pause, und, wo Sie noch äh, Getränke holen können, oben im Café. Und danach äh, zeigen wir die vier Kurzfilme, die wir im Programm haben. Die zeigen wir in einer etwas geänderten Reihenfolge. Wir zeigen dort die vier Kurzfilme, die im Programm stehen, aber wir zeigen die chronologisch und nicht in der Reihenfolge, die sie im Programm sind, das wollte ich schon sagen. Und es gibt immer eine kurze Pause zwischen den Filmen, nicht, dass äh, sie ähm, ja, oberhascht sind, als normale Pause für die äh, äh, nötigen ähm, technischen Änderungen. Ähm, dann kommen wir doch zu heutigen Abend, wie gesagt, und ich bitte jetzt Professor Vinzenz Rediger auf die Bühne, um Leo Philippe vorzustellen. Vielen Dank, viel Spaß. Yeah, vielen Dank, Laura. And I'm oops, going to switch to English. Um, uh, Undead K. 
characters abound in Cinema Marginal. Uh, we started off the series, well, we didn't quite start it off, but it was one of the first films that we showed, was um, <clears throat> O Segredo da Mumia by Ivan Cardoso, which basically transplants an old Hollywood trope, the mummy, in uh, to a Brazilian surrounding. And uh, tonight it's the hour of the vampires, uh, so we're going to uh, be seeing some more classical horror um, uh, characters uh, uh, showing up in the tropical underground. Um, <clears throat> the we've been uh, framing this series in terms of the concept of counterculture. We've been talking about revolution a lot. Um, and we've uh, developed a focus on the late 60s and uh, the early 70s. Uh, we wanted to focus on 68 and the consequences. That was also what the, co what the conference was about um, 10 days ago, um, that particular transitional moment. But uh, a strong case can be made that what uh, gained traction in the 60s and 70s in terms of countercultural practices continues uh, in, in many ways to this day. Um, some of the same uh, cultural figures like Caetano Veloso or Gilberto Gio are still very much present in, in, the, um, in the contemporary Brazilian uh, cultural life. Um, many of the filmmakers that we encounter as 20, 22, 25-year-old filmmakers in this series, uh, when they started off making films as young film critics or young filmmakers like uh, Ruggiero Scanzella or Carlos Reichenbach, uh, continue to make films up until fairly recently, so they all have 30, 40 years careers, and um, uh, I'm raising the aspect of continuity of, of, of those concerns and, and also uh, frameworks, conceptual frameworks, not least because our guest tonight, Leo Felipe, in a way uh, embodies uh, that continuity because he's a critic, uh, he's a DJ, a musician, a writer, a curator, a filmmaker, um, but he's a also a protagonist of that continuing tradition, if we want to call it that, of the Brazilian Brazilian counterculture. Um, he has, uh, when he was uh, only 19 years old, uh, founded an important um, music club in um, Porto Alegre, where I think you were originally from, right? from Porto Alegre, um, a, a punk club called the Garage Mermitica, which uh, became a very important uh, site for the music culture uh, and counterculture and punk culture in, in Brazil. Um, he uh, branched out into journalism, into literature, um, uh, started a blog in, in the early 2000s, which led to um, a book uh, which was published in 2014 called A Fantastica Fabrica. And uh, in that book, he recounts also his trajectory in the Brazilian counterculture and connects it to many of the concepts that we've been discussing here. Um, among them, the, the concept of the molecular revolution. Uh, there's a famous book that um, uh, Brazilian cultural theorist uh, Sueli Ronik wrote together with uh, Félix Cantari, the French psychoanalyst and philosopher, after the democratization or the return to democracy happened in the 1980s. And one of the key points of that book is that um, the revolution in Brazil or the tra social transformation in Brazil is happening through certain cultural practices, through alternative uh, modes of publication, organizing concerts, uh, creating cultural environments um, where the existing cultural hierarchies, uh, hierarchies were questioned and transformed. And uh, in a way, um, an argument could be made that the transformation that we're focusing on when we're talking about the cinema marginal uh, has been turned into a permanent but molecular uh, revolution of which I think I can safely say that Leo Felipe is also a proponent um, and even a protagonist. Um, Leo uh, has come to us from um, Porto Alegre, but he's in the process of moving to Sao Paulo, as I just learned. Um, and he put together this program for us tonight, which is a series of short films um, uh, raising the issue of vampirism in uh, Cinema Marginal in the late 60s and early 70s and 
why all those vampires show up in those films is something that Leo is going to tell us now. Thank you for coming to Frankfurt, and please welcome with me, Leo Felipe. Good night. Uh, I would like to thank you, Vincent and Mark and the whole team of Tropical Underground. You are great. Uh, shall we start? And thank you for coming, of course. <clears throat> there is a vampire in the palace. He's sucking the blood of all the boys and girls he meets. The vampire is tropicalista. He inspires a fantasy in Rio last carnival parade. The vampire has sharp claws, each of them more than 500 years old. His complexion is gray. He wears a black suit under the long cape and his thirst is bottomless. The vampire is vain, perhaps because he cannot see his image in the mirror. In 1964, Brazilian President João Goulart was deposed by the armed forces with the CIA support. The military coup put a violent end to a populist project that was expected to carry out actions that could affect Brazil's rigid social structure. Three years later, in 1968, in, uh, I-5, uh, Institutional Act No. 5 was announced. It was the fifth in a series of 17 institutional acts that would be enacted until October 69. The act gave extra constitutional powers to the executive, legitimizing the political domain of the military regime. I-5 closed the parliament, withdrew political rights, authorized interventions in states and municipalities, and eventually made censorship and torture acceptable forms of political repression. I-5 meant a coup within a coup. It was the beginning of a dark period marked by death, torture, exile, and disappearances. Rede Globo is the most important media group in Brazil. It started in April 65, a year after the military coup, with founding from the Time Life Group. There are two terms that are associated with the counterculture in Brazil. This bungi refers to the escapist stance of those who, at the time of the regime's greatest recrudescence, chose to give up standard political struggle in exchange for a hedonistic engagement of a micro-political dimension. This is the molecular revolution described by philosopher and psychoanalyst Felix, Felix Guattari. The expression refers to the most celebrated and stereotyped part of Brazilian's body, a bunda, the ass. The prefix this denotes, at the same time, denial and movement. Desbundar means to turn your back to the system. While some scholars denounce the pejorative meaning of the word, Antonio Rizério hails it as an example of the incorporation of the lexicon of the favelas, peripheries, and also of candomblé to the slang of the young urban Brazilian. The desbundados, the Brazilian version of the hippies, were ignored by the right and rejected by the left, who considered them the personification of Yankee colonialism. The utopian constellation of this bungee included mystical environmentalism, alternative societies, the use of psychotropic drugs, and the imperatives of the sexual revolution. The neo-romantic ideology of the desbundados made them interested in everything that could escape from the rationalist model of Western culture. Because of that, Brazilian youth turned their attention to Native America and Afro-diasporic cultures. However, it's important to remember that counterculture was an international movement. On contrary to what is usually stated, its expansion in Brazil 
It's do not because, but in spite of the military dictatorship. The term marginalia refers to the underground culture that has gained expression in music, literature, film, and in the press. It is sometimes called post-tropicalism, since it appears shortly after the end of the movement in 1968. The following year, Caetano and Gil, in their first public speeches in exile, start to deny any responsibility for opinions of a collective nature towards Brazilian artistic production. As an ecstatic program, Tropicalia has come to an end. The term marginal in Brazil refers to the outlaw. Marginalia sought to mock the official conservative culture using trans the transgression of customs and, and humor as forms of survival against daily life's brutality under the oppression of the military regime. The artist's self-marginalization was therefore an action program. Its media milestone is the publication of the article Marginalia, Art and Culture in the Stoned Age. The piece was written by journalist Marisa Alvarez Lima. It was published in the magazine O Cruzeiro on December 12, 1968, the day before I-5 was announced. The major contradiction of the proposal is thus visible from its very beginning. Most of the works of the artists identified with marginalia appear in the official environments of record companies, big newspapers, and other mainstream media. Exceptions are made to Super 8 cinema and to the poetry of the mimeograph generation. Those were attempts to escape the logic of production and circulation of the cultural industry. However, the seminal artwork of this movement is the flag created by L.U.H. Sica in the same period. The piece was stenciled with the phrase, seja marginal, seja herói, be an outlaw, be a hero, under the image of the anti-hero Alcir Figueira da Silva. Alcir was a bandit who had taken his own life after an unsuccessful robbery. It is not the image of Cabeça de Cavalo that appears in the artwork, as many people think. The flag was used in a stage set for, in the stage set for Caetano and Gil. The piece provoked the censure of the show in the end of 68 leading to the arrest and subsequent London exile of the musicians in the following year. Oichisika's work is a commentary on the rise of the political violence in Brazil. It also tells about the urgency to elaborate a radical and active, therefore heroic, critique of the system. This critique could only be effective with the decision to live in total transgression. The flag was in tune with the dropout of the North American counterculture. It also makes us think on the choice, considered by many as insanity, of the young activists who, at that moment, decided to engage in the armed struggle. The program of self-marginalization, whether in the fields of politic, politics or the arts, comes from a position of privilege, within the perverse Brazilian social structure. The young artists and activists choose to live as outcasts. 68 marked the beginning of urban guerrilla actions in Brazil with the foundation at the end of the previous year of the National Liberation Action by Carlos Marighella. Marighella is the author of the infamous Mini Manual of the Urban Guerrilla. Since it was written, the book has been banned in many countries. It is again Antonio Rizério who creates an image that allows us to accentuate to the extreme the differences between the young terrorists subjected to a warlike discipline and the desbundado. Rizério suggests the reading of Marighella's book having Novos Baianos as soundtrack. In the, in the chorus 
of one of the album's most famous song, Preta Pretinha, the musicians would sing, Why do not live in this world since there is no other world? Here is Marighella when he was killed by the police, and over there the, the, the cover of the, the album. Torquato Neto was called O Anjo Torto da Tropicália. The Crooked Angel is a character in a poem written by Carlos Drummond de Andrade. The poet Torquato was also a journalist, songwriter, actor, and filmmaker. He can be seen on the cover of the album Manifesto, Tropicalia ou Panis et Circenses, released in July 68. He's alongside Caetano, who holds a portrait of Nara Leão. Gil, holding a portrait of the poet and songwriter Capinã. Tom Zé, Gal, the maestro Rogério Duprá, using a potsy as a cup. And the rock group Os Mutantes. Torquato is the one set with the, the beret. Two songs of the album were written by him. Mamãe Coragem is sung by Gal Costa and Geleia Geral by Gil. Geleia Geral, which could be translated to General Jelly, was also the title of Torquato's newspaper columns, written between 71 and 72. His articles were a mix of personal confessions, intellectual debates, cultural information, existential doubts, and outbursts against problems which, in Torquato's opinion, suffocated the cultural life of Brazil. As journalist, Torquato Neto wrote for several publications. In one of these magazines, called Plug, he and the poet Wally Salomão started a Super 8 front promoting polemics against Cinema Novo. Torquato traveled with Oiticica to London on board of a cargo ship when the artist made his first international exhibition, The Whitechapel Experience. Torquato was sort of a tropicalist herald and also a tragic figure. After a series of hospitalizations due to psychological problems and alcoholism, the poet committed suicide. His death occurred on November 10, 72, in his hometown Teresina, in the northwest of Piauí. He died a day after his 28th birthday. He left a wife and a young son. His writings were published in the book The Last Days of Pauperia in 1974. In the same year, a one-issue magazine idealized by him and Wally was also published. Navi Louca was an avant-garde publication with works by several artists from the marginal group, among them Caetano, Ivan Cardoso, Oiticica, Rogério Duarte, Décio Pignatari, the Campos Brothers, and Ligia Clark, the only woman present in the group. The Brazilian counterculture was a men's club. There is, there is something affirmative about madness in Torco... Oops. There is something affirmative about madness in Torquato's work, but this understanding led him to a dilemma, to accept the authoritarian reason, denying himself, or deny reason, moving toward self-destruction. His choice can be understood as an example of the non-viability of the counterculture as an alternative social practice. In the end, it will be always culture. Uh, this is the, the poster of the Nosferatu no Brasil. It, it appeared on Navi Louca. Um, and then uh, you notice the, the blaze over there. The blade. How can a vampire live under the intense light of the tropics? Torquato had a fascination with the image of this creature full of an aggressive, scary, and subterranean power. The cold kiss, the hot teeth, and the taste of honey. Filmmaker Ivan Cardoso made Torquato the main character of his first feature, Nosferatu in Brazil. The film tells the story of a hippie vampire who travels from Transylvania to Copacabana. Torquato also appeared in another of Cardoso's movie, 
the mummy returns to attack from 72. Both productions are part of a series of Super 8 short films called by Cardoso Cotidianas Codax. We can see that. Ivan Cardoso apresenta, presents Cotidiana Codax, Super 8. Nosferatu was shot among... Uh, excuse me. Nosferatu, I'm sorry. Nosferatu was shot almost without any budget in locations outdoors during 10 days in 1971. Director Ivan Cardoso used a very poetic strategy to solve the problem of a vampire who walks in broader daylight. The insertion of a title card that reads, Where si day, si night. It's, it's here. Onde se vê dia, veja se noite. It is a detournement of a concrete poem of Afonso Avila. And now I, um, I didn't want to translate the, the concrete poem, but I put it on Google Translate, and Google translated so well. Uh, the translation, it is, where it sees that, it seems that. Cardoso's first film would start the subgenre called Terrir, made of low-budget comedies that recreate the gothic image, image, imagine, im, im, imagery in a kitschy way. The bloodthirsty orgy at the end of the film reminds us of the concept of anthropophagy. O Manifesto Antropofágico was written by modernist poet Oswaldo de Andrade in 1928. The, test, the text was the main conceptual ingredient from which the tropicalists brew their unique soup made up of national folklore and international pop trends. The myth of the blood sucker was also explored by Jorge Mautner, who highlighted the bisexual ambiguity of the creature in a song composed in 1969 in London. You notice that uh, everybody was in London in 1969. Jorge Mautner, Gilberto Gil. So the counterculture in Brazil, it's, it's really close to the original uh, thing. The song O Vampiro, The Vampire, would be recorded by Caetano Veloso 10 years later, the same year of the amnesty law that would benefit both guerrillas and government torturers. Nineteen sixty nine saw the appearance of another Batman in Brazilian popular culture. Jardes Macalé defended Gotham City at the Fourth International Song Festival. The chorus, Beware, There is a Bat at the Front Door, translated the police haunted wonder of the era. In the 80s, comedian Chico Anísio created Bento Carneiro, a Brazilian vampire with malnutrition and a hick accent. More than 30 years later, in 2013, a public servant from Rio de Janeiro was noted from using a Batman costume during demonstration which destabilized the government, allowing the process that led to Dilma Rousseff's impeachment. And what about the former federal Supreme Court Judge Joaquim Barbosa with his long black cloak and his vigilante pose? Barbosa announced his presidential candidacy in this year's election, but he gave, but he gave it up later. In their cannibalistic thirst for blood, Dracula, Batman, Nosferatu, and the president are all the same bat. The paradox contained in the image of a vampire in the tropics is precisely what causes us so much fascination. The sinister basements of the Brazilian dictatorship housed many monsters. They represent the dark and deadly forces that control from inside of the palaces the lifeblood of the people through fear. The ample, general, and unrestricted amnesty of Figueiredo's dictatorship prevented the stakes from being stuck in the hearts of the bloodsuckers. 
those torturers never paid for their crimes. It was in the basement of Jaburu Palace, the vice president's official house in Brasilia, that Michel Temer received his bribe, according to the media. This is a w artwork uh, from Traplev, a young Brazilian artist. He prints this... Um, this um, um, manchete, how can I say that? Uh, headlines, I'm sorry. He prints these headlines, and, and in this headline we can read, uh, it was in the basement of Palácio do Jaburu. I don't know if uh, everybody knows, but Michel Temer was the vice president of Dilma Rousseff's uh, government. In their cannibal... In 1972, Torquato returned to his hometown, Teresina. After a period of psychiatric hospitalizations, he produced two Super 8 films with some local friends. Terror from Vermelha and Adam and Eve from Paradise to Consumption. This last one was lost, having left only some photographs of the filming process. In some of these pictures, we can see Torquato in the character of Adam. Terror from Vermelha tells the story of, the, of a serial killer who commits his crimes in the neighborhood called Vermelha, which means red in Portuguese. Terror from Vermelha was the chance to Torquato put in practice some ideas he had, he had been developing about filmmaking in his articles. Cinema had a privileged place among the poet's interests. Terror from Vermelha has the same grotesque the Boucher represent in Nosferatu do Brasil. Both films show a series of crimes committed by an anti-hero who seems to be misplaced under the sunlight. Due to his suicide, Torquato never could watch the film. An essay on the work was published in his posthumous book, The Last Days of Pauperia. The text was used later as a guide for editing the film. In this essay, Torquato argues that a film is made of a sequence of shots, not a sequence of scenes. He quotes Godard, quoting Vertov, and counts the use of nine cartridges of ectachrome Kodak in the shooting. He also mentions his stay in the Meduna Sanatorium in Teresina. I would like to read a fragment from this essay in the language it was originally written. For those who don't understand Portuguese, I apologize. It's a very short piece. A. Um filme é feito de planos. A, B, C. Um plano depois do outro, depois do outro, depois do outro, depois do outro. Planos. Não é feito de cena, rapaziada Cineclub. Um plano é um plano. Por quanto montagem é ante sempre montagem. É ante sempre uma análise de planos e mais soma, divisão, multiplicação, subtração. Certo disso, Ziga Vertov, citado por Godard em inglês. Montar um filme antes da filmagem. Montar um filme durante a filmagem. Montar um filme depois da filmagem. Fazer um filme. Marginalia is the name given to any note made in the margins of a text. My footnotes on the Brazilian counterculture come from the underground. The program is completed with the exhibition of Andrea Tonacci's first short films. Tonacci's urban cinema of early years helped to define the language of cinema marginal. Later, his camera would be moved from the urban centers to the distant fields and hills. The filmmaker's main theme is disorder. Blah 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 was released in the troubled year of 1968. Paulo Gracindo, Nelson Xavier, and Irma Alvarez compose a typical cast of characters of the Latin America political struggle, the dictator, the activist, and the guerrilla fighter. As they keep talking, their discursive abstractions are overwhelmed by reality. The short film, was awarded at the Fourth Festival of Brasilia in the same year Rogério's Gonzalez, in the same year Rogério's Gonzalez, the Red Light Bandit, won as Best Feature Film. 
Tonache's first work, Eye for an Eye, from 1965, takes place in a car that runs through Sao Paulo streets. The filmmaker will later develop this idea in his first full-length movie, Bang Bang, which is the work that will be shown in the last presentation of this seminar next month. The three characters in the Eye for Eye typify the privileged and bored youth who re rehearses revolts against the system. I like to imagine in what kind of dropping out these characters would engage in 1968. Would they go for guerrilla or this or this bungee or this bungee? So uh, the the thing is that I, that I want to uh, make 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 it clear that all this many of the tropicalists travel to London. And they got this, this close relation. They saw the counterculture happening there. So in Brazil, the thing is very close, or I don't know very close, but it, but, but, but it drank from this, the, the same sources, in a sense. And the other point is that uh, the idea of the anti-hero who, who has to kill himself, the same as uh, Alcide Figueira da Silva, the bandit in the Helio Chisica's flag, the difference is this one is anonymous. Everybody thinks that it's Cabeça de Cavalo. And Torquato, uh, he's not anonymous, but uh, he's not well known in Brazil and, and abroad, I guess. Uh, last year, there is this, uh, it was made this documentary on him that will be shown also here in this uh, cycle. And um, my intention was to talk about him. He's a very important a character in Brazilian cultural scene, he can be compared to those to those young musicians that die at 28, like uh, Jim Morrison or Jimi Hendrix, James Joplin. Um, I guess that's it. Thank you, Shen. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the for the presentation and for the program. Um, the negotiating the program was a was a process. Uh, you, when we invited you, you gave us a list of films you wanted to show, and then as this evening approached, um, you revised the program and revised it again. And in the end, we showed the films in chronological order. Um, but every program, of course, makes an argument, creates new meanings by juxtaposing the films, and and there's a something coming out of the program as as such. So, I was wondering how, whether you could comment on your selection of those films and how you put them together. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you for the invitation, and I think Torquato would like to to know that the their movie his movies uh, uh, exhibited in, in such contest as this. Well, uh, my idea was to, to bring Torquato's work um, uh, um, for the first, uh, the first thought, you know. And I didn't know about the documentary, uh, Todas as Horas do Fim. And, and then I suggested that the, the two last films, uh, Terror da Vermelha and Nosferatu. And then you said, well, we need uh, more, uh, more, more films. And then I chose the, both the, the two movies from uh, Andrea Tornacci uh, because of the, the length, actually. Uh, but now seeing them uh, all together, I think it makes a lot of sense because I, I, I never watched them uh, the four films in, in a row like mm -hmm. this, you know, and well, they they are, they are about violence. Exactly. That that's the point, and I think th the, this this um, opposition be between desbundados, the desbundi, the hippie thing, and the the activism, the 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 guerrilla and the the partisan, you know, and I think we can. It, it's it's. It's like the, the suggestions by Antonio Rizzerio that we should 
listen uh, uh, novos baianos while reading uh, the guerrilla manual mm. it's almost like that because the, the tonache's movie well especially blah 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 um, it's almost a documentary about uh, fictional documentary in a in a sense about this this moment in brazil 68 and um, i think uh, um, i think it's it's interesting to see the, the the four films because it tells about counterculture in brazil because the the, the first one uh, eye for an eye uh, well they're punks in a sense and then now watching the film i thought uh, because i i, I ask a question um would these guys engage on the, this bunge or on guerrilla maybe they would engage on on police violence maybe you know because they are uh, bourgeois and bored bourgeois and um, well mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly i mean but what, what what happens when you put together a program like that is that obviously you the, the, the viewer us the audience start looking for thematic threats and start looking for you know the, the for for things that ties the films together and I, I was going to say what what brings the films together um, blah 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 is a little less obvious in in, in the series but certainly um, the first film and 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 the, the third and fourth film is is not just to focus on violence I think that's the general threat of the program but but uh, a the moments where intimacy turns into violence so where um uh tenderness becomes lethal uh i mean that's the whole thing about the vampire you know the, the seduction that the deadly seduction um and and if we consider that in the broader context of of the brazilian counterculture of the moment and of Particularly left-wing political debates, you know, the, the the question of how the revolutionary struggle should be organized or how political activism should be organized. Um, I think that's it, it. Seems like a, a like th these motives articulate those core concerns, like you said. You know, the the, the this bungee or somehow the irresponsible, politically irresponsible uh, people. You know, they just. Uh, abandon traditional left-wing politics and disappear into uh, an esoteric hippie lifestyle it's it's a, a reproach that has also been made uh, or a criticism that has been offered about uh, tropicalia that they were being irresponsible and that that they just word off into a weird kind of um, mainstream popular culture um, rather than continuing um, uh, uh, continuing sort of the the, the the good the traditional good left wing left wing struggle, and so so for these films to have this particular focus on on violence and then intimacy and violence yeah, seems to articulate that problem. No, it's it's uh, well uh, Torquato killed himself like a month after shooting uh, Terror da, da Vermelha, so it, it it is intimacy becoming uh, violence because. Uh, well, uh, by the way, he killed uh, himself using gas because um, in the scene, in one of the scenes of the From Terror da Vermelha, he was the one who who, who is uh, strangled by the rope, uh, and then the the uh, the blade appears constantly, uh, especially in Terror da in Nosferatu no Brasil. So I I was thinking about this. Well, this this kind of deadly images or images about death you know i was wondering about torquato if if maybe he knew he would kill <coughs> himself after this right that that is sort of a premonition of, of yeah, what yeah. was going to happen yes and well one thing i think there is important I, I ended up cutting out from the 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 presentation but uh one one part about uh poetry because poetry is very important uh, in Brazilian cultural life of the 20th century. Well, we start uh, the modernism of 22. Poetry has a very important role. And then after that, the two cycles that ended up, uh, that ended our modernism, uh, the two movements that ended our modernism, modernist cycle 
um, are Tropicalia, which is, well, we know that. Uh, in Tropicalia, I think poetry got rhythm and po poetry turns to music, turns to song. And the other one is called Poema Processo. Uh, well, there is Concretismo also uh, from the 50s, uh, which is the, the sense that, well, words are concrete. So you can, words are, are, are things. And then in Poema Processo, it's, it's almost like Concretismo becomes uh, goes, uh, goes political. Mm. It's like, try to, to bring this kind of more traditional left-wing um, look at things to this uh, so formalist uh, thing, which is Concretismo. And then I think we can notice here by the use of the card titles uh, when, mm. well, a lot of words repeating, repeating, and the first, uh, the, the, the version I saw uh, uh, of Terror da Vermelha didn't have these this, uh, titles in the beginning and the end. It, this is something that, I guess, um, I don't know if, if it, it's not on the script, that on this test, on this essay was, that yeah, they used for Yeah, I was going to ask editing. about it, yeah, because, because uh, the... Um, those type, the opening and, and closing titles on the film, they seem to, um, they were obviously made on a computer, um, so it's electronic images, and uh, one of them, uh, the, the final title sequence was dated 1974, so it was clearly posthumously edited by someone else, not Torquato Nito. Yeah, because he didn't, he didn't even watch the film, he died uh, before that, and then uh, the, the guys, well, s someone who edited the, the movie, uh, used this essay that was published in '74 to to assemble it, and uh, this uh, the the titles um, are writings Torquato writings right, indeed, exactly. yeah. So they added added the poems and and uh, yeah. In in terms of poetry, he also quoted Carlos uh, Drummond de Andrade, who was uh, an, an influence on Torquato Nito. Um, yeah, because uh, Carlos Drummond de Andrade has this very famous poem, uh, Quando nasci um anjo torto me disse, when I was born a crooked angel told me, go Carlos, be, vai ser gauche na vida, go, go, go and be gauche, uh, well, it's in French, uh, in life. And then uh, people compare Torquato with this, with this character hmm. of the crooked angel, the, right. the anjo torto. As like him being the so, sort him of being the, the character, uh, yeah, the, the character, the inspiration, yeah, yeah, the inspiration what, like poetry. embody, embody. In, in a sense, it's like that. Torquato embodied poetry. Um, one uh, detail I wanted to bring up is in in the first film, the the, the Tonacci film, uh, which was edited by Ruggiero Scanzella. Um, the editing is actually very striking. The, the the rhythm that the film has and and uh, it also it's it's from sixty six right so sixty five yeah. so when Gonzalo was still working mostly as a critic and was moving into into filmmaking before he made his his own films but he's clearly uh, developing uh, a style and he's clearly preparing the ground for. Um, the way he depicts the uh, urban space in in uh, uh, Ubandido de Luz Vermelha and the other films that he then later makes. Uh, so just, just in terms of Scanzello's biographies, this seems to be a very interesting film and an important film. Yeah, and Scanzello, I think the, the first short film of, uh, of him, it's very, uh, it seems very like this, this mm. one, uh, Olho por Olho. Um, uh, film, uh, the film is... Uh, there are two characters, they are uh, riding in the city and discuss cinema. The thing is this, this discuss cinema, but it's, it's much, uh, much like this one. Okay. Do we have questions from the audience? Things you want to bring up or, and discuss? Oh, I have a question, perhaps, yes, or uh, more like a comment. It's uh, clear that uh, the soundtrack and music is very important. More obviously, in the second, the 
last two films. But already in the first film from uh, Tonacci, it's also like what's playing in the radio is already uh, also calling my attention when I was watching this. And I was thinking whether you could comment a little bit on this, um, on the music well, this, use. This is something very countercultural in a sense because rock is, uh, it's uh, like, I think rock is the, the most important media of counterculture in, in a sense. And they they all love rock and roll. It's Gonzaga, all those guys, and um, I like uh, I like more the, the 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 soundtrack of Nosferatu no Brasil. I think it's very interesting because uh, he uh, Ivan Cardoso uses uh, some Rolling Stones songs. They're not very famous, and in in a psychedelic uh, part and. What else could I say? Well, uh, Roberto Carlos plays twice in, the, in two films, in, in, in Olho por Olho, and again in um, Nosferatu no Brasil. Uh, uh, the song is Detalhes, I don't know. That's the, that's the one that's playing on the, on the Copacabana yeah, scene, yeah. which uh, also I was asking myself, was, is, uh, to what extent that was ironic? So, 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 like, I mean, if you consider the tensions that there were between rock music and bossa nova, and the scandal that Tropicalia created by bringing rock elements into or confronting it, combining it with musica popular brasileira, um, I was wondering whether that was ironic or, or straightforward. Well, they love Roberto Carlos, actually. Okay. All, all of all, all, all the tropicalistas love love him. Um, but I guess it, it is ironic. There is a, a title uh, when we, we can read uh, uh, Sem Sangue Não Se Faz História. Without blood, we don't make history. It's, <laughs> it's, it's definitely ironic. Um, you, you described the, the vampire as an existential hero. Can you elaborate on that? Further. Well, this is more something that, uh, that Torquato thought about the vampire. He mm. was, he loved this this character, and I don't know if if uh, if he started to love after the movie or before it. I don't mm. know uh, this, but I think he he already identified himself with the the vampire, and he wrote uh, once that the, the vampire has the. Um, I can't, uh, the, the teeth, the long teeth, and the taste of, uh, he, he doesn't say the taste of blood, he says the taste of honey. Mm -hmm. So for the vampire, the blood is sweet, probably. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, it's very romantic the way he, he identifies himself with the, the vampire, this lonely creature, because he lives for a thousand years, and people are dying, the vampire still lives. So I think in that is in that sense that Torquato uh, thinks that a vampire is an existentialist figure, you know, because he he lives. Yeah. Um, Even being dead, he lives. Right. <laughs> yeah, the f the figure of the undead. Uh, the w one of the things that that is a constant reference. Um, in the cinema marginal, in but in tropical as well, and you quoted Torquato uh, with his poem about the cinema, where he says the cinema is a shot and a shot and a shot, uh, which is a clear reference to Godard. Um, Godard seems to be a absolutely non-controversial reference for all of these people. I mean, if you if you we talked uh, about uh, Gaetano Veloso's uh, Tropical Truth, his autobiography, and um, there's a lot of references he discusses in in that film. But it always comes through that that for all his concerns for uh, every area of artistic production that he thinks about, Godard is the reference. He's like Godard is the one. Uh, can you say something about? That, was, that kind of reverence for, yeah, for Godard, uh, the uh, presence of Godard in, in Brazil. There was a cine, cine, cine club, how mm -hmm. can I say this in English? Cine club? Well, during the 60s in Rio, it called Cine Paisandu. 
It was a, and they show a lot of Godard movies. And I think all this, this whole generation um, go there, went there and saw, saw these movies. It was very um, important for this generation. And I think Godard is, everybody in, during the 60s were, well, not everybody, but the most experimental artists in the 60s were into Godard. And, Yes, but I mean, he's a Godard is a sort of a global figure and a global phenomenon, and and uh, you know, even even Adorno loved Godard. Yeah, really. Like, yeah, he went to watch all the Godard films. He never wrote about them, uh, sadly, but but it is quite well known that you know they were shown here in town, and so he went there. But uh, with with the Cinema Marginal, um, I, I I think that the what you can see is that the Godard films served as a direct template for what they were doing, like the the the, the way of reading urban space, the way of juxtaposing, using the words, also. using the words, uh, musical montage, uh, ri writing, and and image, uh, um, out of sync, uh, out, out of sync, uh, quoting quoting other films. Um, it just seems to have had a deeper impact. In, in Brazilian counterculture than anything I've observed in terms of, I mean, that's a project. We could do a, a global Godard study and <laughs> uh, try and figure out how, how Godard inflected on, on global cinema in the 60s and, and going forward. But, but there seems to be a very intimate understanding of what he was trying achieve, to achieve in, in this group of artists, and filmmakers, musicians, poets. I don't know. I think, I think it's 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 Gonzalez, uh thing because he uh, was very mental. Mental, uh, no, mental is it's crazy. It's, it, he was very yeah. intellectual, and wow, he was a movie. He's also mental. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I mean, he was uh, uh, of course a film critic and, and reflecting on it, but but um, it, it seems to it seems to be a reference across the board. I mean, that's. Um, very, uh, very and, well, and the in Terror da Vermelha, it's it's almost a home, a um, home movie. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, uh, it's, it is. It's it, 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 because Torquato uh, lived in Rio and São Paulo. He went to London, and well, after all of this, he went to Teresina. He went back to Teresina. So it's like a sentimental journey in right. the city, with all these characters are neighbor neighbors of him and. I think his mom and his dad are also in the film. I mean, you see people from his family and everything. Right. Like he really went back to his childhood neighborhood to to shoot this. Yeah, yeah. So literally, also a home movie. And the the the, the, the titles are are very uh, concrete poetry because it's ver ou vir. Uh, um, it, uh, ver it's to see. To see. Ou vir is to hear, but yeah. oh, it's or. So it's. Uh, it's to see or to come, but it's to see to hear. It's like this this games of game words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about that perhaps I, I kind of apologize that there were no subtitles for this uh, part for for the last two films with the I, I, but it would have been very difficult to translate it. You just notice, so uh, I, I kind of decided to just show them like this and hope that the uh, meaning would come through somehow <laughs> because some kind of translation. Could have even have yeah. It's I don't know if it would have helped much <laughs> to understand, but yeah. But uh, sorry, on one hand, that there were no subtitles for the film. Yeah, you would actually have to design subtitles where all these various combinations, you know, the the the, the multiple ways of reading the combination of wir and wer uh, uh, would have come through. So that's concrete poetry or process poetry um, uh, in action. Yes. Do we have other questions or comments from the audience at this point? Okay. If not, thank you very much. Thanks for bringing thank the so films much. here and for yes. introducing them. Thank you very much and for the invitation. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. You were wonderful.
<laughs> Thank you. And yeah, I like I already said in the beginning, I invite you to all the following events of Tropical Underground this month. Next one being next Wednesday at the Muzon Tourm at six o'clock. And don't miss the documentary about the Quattro Neto. Uh, that was also a tip from, from Leo uh, that we're showing here on the 24th. So I hope to see you all here. And, and also, if you've become interested in Andrea Tonacci, yeah, bang bang it's, is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great movie yeah that's a, a legendary film that you absolutely have to come and see on july 5th which will be the big bang ending of our tropical underground program here oh if you are interested in the text i can send uh, just get in touch with absolutely with folks here and then I, because sometimes my spelling is it's not very understandable <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for staying, and I'll uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.